welcome to Behind the Ticker. I'm Brad Roth, Chief Investment Officer of Thor Financial Technologies and Portfolio Manager of THLV, the Thor Low Volatility ETF. Behind the Ticker uncovers the inner workings of the ETF industry. We will interview portfolio managers and ETF service providers to dive deep into their work lives and their businesses. We will learn the inner workings of their strategies and what drives them as they continue to grow their company. Many of these individuals are entrepreneurs and will have unique and compelling insights to share as much goes on behind the ticker. Please note, nothing in this show is investment advice, and it is meant solely for educational and entertainment purposes only. Welcome to Behind the Ticker. Today we have on Matt Berry. He is the head of capital markets at Touchstone Investments. And as Matt puts it, they are distinctively active. They have a handful of mutual funds as well as ETFs, all of which are actively managed. So we talk about the explosion of active ETFs over the last couple of years. We also talk about their manager due diligence process. Everything they do is sub-advised, so they have a very thorough manager due diligence process. We talk a little bit about distribution And then we talk about two of their ETFs, specifically HEAT, which is a climate transition ETF, and TSEC, T-S-E-C, the Touchstone Securitized Income ETF. So without further ado, please welcome Mr. Matt Berry. Hey, Matt. Welcome to the show. Hey, Brad. Thanks for having me. So before we get started, uh, could you tell us a little bit about your background and kind of how you got into the position that you are today? Yeah, so uh, I'm I'm Matt Berry. I run product management and ETF capital markets for Touchstone Investments. Uh, I've been with Touchstone and also our parent company before that for uh, combined about 10 years now. Uh, Joined after business school and then uh, Touchstone is about a $25 billion mutual fund manager. Um, So historically, that's been our business. Uh, As part of my time running product here, we saw the writing on the wall as far as ETFs and continued growth of active ETFs. And really, that's where the puck was going, where we wanted to skate to. Uh, and so over the past few years, a big part of what I've been working on is building out the ETF platform uh, that we launched uh, about a year and a half ago with our initial ETFs. And that's where kind of the, the head of ETF capital markets uh, came in as well for me. So um, before we get into Touchstone and a little bit about what you guys do over there, I always like to ask... Uh, any hobbies? What do you like to do when you're not sitting behind the desk? Yeah, so I, I like getting outside a lot. Um, trying to play a lot more golf this year. Uh, like to travel, outdoorsy stuff. Um, my wife and I hiked to Kilimanjaro a few years ago, so that was uh, probably the, the coolest one of those trips uh, we've done. And then uh, next year, we're going to do a, a little trip to Switzerland to do some hiking. Oh, that sounds great. Well, your golf season is over if you're in Cincinnati. I, I'm seeing snow out my window as we speak. Yeah, I, last time I played it was about a week ago, and it was in the 40s, and now it's like 20 here. So that uh, things change quickly. It's, it's yeah. almost ski season here, so I'll switch to that. Yeah, season is uh, season is over. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about Touchstone's business, kind of the whole breadth of, of product and services and, and kind of what the whole business is about? Yeah, so at Touchstone, we are distinctively active. Uh, that's our mantra. Everything we do is very active. If you look at our strategies, they'll, they'll typically look very different from the benchmarks uh, because we believe that to be able to beat the benchmark, a prerequisite is you have to look different from the benchmark. Um, so you'll typically see high conviction in the best ideas, portfolios with a relatively higher tracking error. Uh, we are fully sub-advised. Uh, so we have 15 different sub-advisors uh, that we go out and hire to run uh, in a particular asset class. And it's really finding best in breed institutional caliber asset managers uh, to run our strategies on the mutual fund side. And then over the last year and a half uh, on the ETF side as well in our suite of active ETFs. So what is it about active specifically? Is it uh, that you guys want to focus on it uh, solely, right? Is it is it trying to uh, provide that differentiation? Is it risk management? Is it alpha generation? You know, what is it about active that you guys really like, and and why you focus in that area specifically? Yeah, so I think when when you take a look at the universe of um, investing overall, but within active managers uh, in particular, you'll you'll see a lot of of strategies that um, have a few ailments that make it hard to generate alpha. Uh, you know, managers that are so big have tens or hundreds of billions of dollars and, and are by almost definition forced to look a lot like the benchmark. Uh, and so that makes it very difficult for them to be able to beat the benchmark. 
Uh, so the niche that we're trying to fill there is, uh, you know, it's more of a specialist manager, uh, more cognizant of the capacity of our strategies. We want to manage that. Uh, our subadvisors continue to offer the ability to uh, add really strong alpha through risk adjusted returns, also protect on the downside. And what that looks like varies a little bit depending on strategy, where some managers uh, you know, might be higher on the upside, others might focus more on the downside. It really varies uh, in terms of managers across our, the breadth of our roster. So, so having that many sub advisors and and doing kind of manager due diligence, what in your mind makes a good active management team and a good sub advisor? Yeah, so we we have our framework. We call it Spider. It's spelled uh, in a kind of goofy way, S P I D I R. Um, that's basically our version of you know the piece: people, process, performance, uh, where we look at the organizational stability, personnel, infrastructure, investment discipline, and results. Um, so that's kind of our framework for evaluating our managers. Um, one of the things we do is you know, we're not testing with our clients' money. We're, we're hiring managers that have a demonstrated track record of performance, re- repeatable investment process, uh, and something that we think is really differentiable when we look at the competitive landscape. We do a lot of work uh, looking at the competitors before we bring strategies to market uh, and making sure that we have a, a lot of conviction in the managers that we hire, their ability to continue doing what they've demonstrated uh, in the past, and that they're set up for future success as well. So with with Touchstone specifically, you know, what comes first? Are you guys doing manager due diligence and finding managers um, to launch strategies that you guys um, might want to bring to market or managers coming to you? Like how does the ETF creation process at Touchstone work? Is it the, is it the strategy first or the idea first and then a ma- manager builds it? Or are you finding an existing strategy that you're bringing to market? Um, some of both. Uh, it depends on the circumstance. So I, I'd start out by saying we, we take a lot of meetings. Our our stance in general is trying to take as many as possible, you know, all constantly from uh, institutional asset managers that are looking for new avenues to grow their strategies, open up a retail market with our 50 plus person distribution team that targets the advisor intermediary channel that's not necessarily the bread and butter from a distribution standpoint of those institutional asset managers. Um, So we have several hundred meetings a year with uh, asset managers across asset classes. Um, Sometimes at times in the past, we've had a particular search. Um, So on the mutual fund side a few years ago, an example of that, we looked in in the liquid alt space, um, ended up hiring uh, Aries Capital to to hire uh, to run our credit opportunity strategy. consists of high yield bank loan CLOs uh, in the below investment grade space. That was an example of something where we had a very specific search uh, and we're really happy with uh, that manager and and how they've performed there. Um, We've also had circumstances where it was more opportunistic. Um, So our heat ETF is a great example of that. Uh, It's our climate transition ETF we launched earlier this year. Uh, That was one where we weren't necessarily saying we really want to have a climate transition ETF. But we were open-minded and a really intriguing manager came across our, our uh, desk. Uh, we continued the conversation. I thought it was really differentiable. And they, they've run a lot of money over in Europe. Uh, I think it's a timely strategy and uh, it was something that was reactive to that. Um, and something we brought to market this year. Yeah, that's. I, I have a, a handful of questions specifically for Heat. So we'll, let's get back to that here in a couple of minutes. But uh, before, before we do that, um, the active... ETF landscape as a whole, right? We've seen a massive explosion in active ETFs uh, over the last, you know, couple of years. What do you think attributes to the growth in that space, and why we're seeing so many managers and issuers come to market with active ETFs? Yeah, so I, I think uh, there's a couple things. One on the just some of the structural benefits of the vehicle, the investors demanding. So we're seeing a lot of demand for the, the types of active strategies we've always offered, but the ability to also wrap those in a vehicle that offers the tax efficiency, the liquidity, the transparency, those benefits that ETFs have always been known for. Um, so that's key reason why investors are, are becoming more and more interested in active ETFs. Uh, the other key thing that happened is a few years ago, the ETF rule. Uh, so once the SEC adopted Rule 6C11, it just made it a lot easier for active managers to come to market. So instead of filing exemptive relief for each individual strategy, you can rely on that uh, rule. It makes it a much less cumbersome uh, process uh, and also allowed uh, tools like custom baskets, tools that are kind of the inner workings of ETFs that weren't widely available before. Now active managers are able to fully utilize tools like that and it really leveled the playing field. 
All right. So let's talk, let's talk about heat. Let's talk about a couple of your ETFs. Um, this is the climate transition ETF that you already alluded to. Can you give me a very high level overview of what the strategy is and what it's trying to accomplish? Yeah. So it's managed by Lombard ODA. They're, they're a, a Swiss firm that's several hundred billion dollars of assets dating back to the 1700s. So extremely long pedigree uh, tenure there. Um, had to read that a few times initially. I thought it was a typo. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they've been around a while. Uh, they're really in the forefront of sustainable investing. They've uh, raised over a billion dollars in Europe in this strategy. Um, they are looking to invest in companies that are going to benefit from the transitioning climate environment. Um, so one of those buckets is a, there's three different buckets there. One of them is a clean energy uh, solutions providers buckets. That's probably most similar to some of the other competitors that, that you'll see out there that really focus on your solar companies and your wind companies. Uh, but the thing that makes heat really unique is they've got a couple of other uh, types of companies they're targeting as well. Uh, one is the transition leaders. So uh, companies that are more carbon intensive. So it can be something like a steel company that you might not expect to be in a, a climate transition environment, but the steel company that's kind of on the forefront of becoming uh, more sustainable over time. Uh, and they also look at companies that are going to um, benefit from the adaptation to a, uh, a warmer environment. Uh, the reality is that the world is getting warmer. We're behind on some of the goals on climate change. So things like air conditioning companies that can make really efficient, efficient air conditioning equipment to help us adapt and live in a warmer environment should benefit from that environment. Um, so Lombard is really trying to take advantage of, the, of all these factors that we think are going to be a really big mega trend over the next uh, decade, multiple decades type time period, and find companies that are best positioned to benefit from that. So as, as much as you can speak on it, do you know how the fund is really screening and finding these opportunities? Yeah, so they've got a very robust team. Um, they partner with Oxford for some of the academic research over there. Um, it's all active. Uh, so they're looking at um, their sustainability team and then their investment team, looking at uh, kind of bottom-up fundamental research. Um, based on those three buckets and trying to find the best ideas uh, from across the world. It's a global portfolio. So around 60% of it is in the U.S. right now and the other 40 uh, internationally. Um, so a team with dozens of people kind of scouring the, the world to find those um, 40 to 50 best ideas there. So it's a, it's a pretty highly convicted portfolio. And how are they weighting uh, those names inside of the portfolio? Is it equal weight? Is it market cap? Are they doing it or are they making you know, bets based on fundamentals of the company? Like, how are they waiting? How are they waiting the ETF? Yeah, so it is a, a very high conviction best ideas portfolio. Um, they're, it's not equal weighted. It, they're looking at it from a risk management perspective. So a risk management team is in it as well, looking at exposures to different countries, different factors, uh, and then weighting it based on conviction. So the best ideas um, are, are overweighted there. And, and is it... Is everything done kind of on the fly or are they doing kind of a, a weekly, monthly, quarterly, annual rebalance or reconstitution? Or is it, uh, you know, a real pure active type strategy where, you know, they can make decisions day to day? Yeah. So in the, in the ETF vehicle, we're looking at it on a monthly basis. Um, so for SMA, they might rebalance it a little more frequently, but it is active. It's not on a set cadence that's quarterly or annually. We're looking at it uh, monthly and, and being able to utilize some of the tools like custom baskets as we rebalance that to make sure we do get the, the tax efficiency and the benefits that the ETF vehicle is known for. So if you're if you or your distribution team is really talking to an investment advisor about heat, where would you kind of sleeve this in an overall model portfolio construction? Yeah. So we've had a lot of conversations around that because the you know, thematics have really emerged over the last year has become a much bigger slice of the investment universe. Um, I think the interesting thing about heat is it's more broad based than some of the other sustainable clean energy things that are really high beta and have gotten really beat up so far this year. Uh, so it does make a good complement to kind of the global international, uh, the global equity portion of an investor, uh, best investors portfolio. So what we've seen a lot of advisors doing is kind of uh, taking that kind of core exposure and then use heat as a satellite to pair with it. Uh, to get an investor uh, exposure to a theme that they might be um, might be passionate about. Sure. So if it's okay with you, I'd like to pivot. Um, I quickly want to talk about TSEC, uh, the Touchstone yeah. Securitized Income ETF. 
We're going to go through the same exercise here. You know, what is the fund looking to do? What's it trying to accomplish? What's in it? Uh, can you just talk at a high level about the fund? Yeah. So I'll talk, um, I'll kind of pair two of them together, TSEC and then the two. Tusi are run by the same team at Fort Washington. Mm -hmm. um, we launched Tusi. That was one of our first four ETFs. Is the Touchstone Ultra Short Income ETF. Uh, so it's been a, a, out for about a year and a half now. It was, uh, launched last summer. Um, Fort Washington's short duration team really emphasizes securitized investments. Uh, so Tusi will have some corporate in there, but overweight securitized investments. When we think securitized investments, residential uh, mortgage-backed securities, commercial mortgage-backed securities, asset-backed securities, uh, collateralized loan obligations. Those are kind of the key building blocks of that strategy. Um, historically, securitized investments have been a really interesting place to be from a risk-return uh, profile perspective, relative to something like investment-grade corporates or high-yield corporates. Um, the team at Fort Washington has run Ultra Short in our mutual fund for um, – well over a decade now. Uh, the team's been together for over 20 years. Uh, actually, it's a very stable team with a lot of experience running uh, short duration investments, specifically in securitized. So we launched uh, 2C about a year and a half ago, and then we launched TSEC, uh, which is somewhat similar uh, a few months ago. So it's our most recent active ETF. Um, TSEC is the Touchdown Securitized Income ETF. It is uh, fully securitized. So we're a 2C, we'll invest some in corporates. Uh, TSEC does not, it's pretty much all securitized. Uh, those same four building blocks that I mentioned as far as mortgages, asset backed, and CLOs. Um, the key differences are ultra short, it's in the ultra short category. TSEC is going to be in the short duration. So think kind of two to three year kind of duration instead of under a year for the ultra short ETF. Uh, and then it's also targeting a little more aggressive um, type investment from a risk return profile perspective. Uh, 2C is almost all investment grade. By prospectus, it's at least 85%. Uh, in reality, it's, it's uh, significantly higher than that. Uh, TSEC is going to be at least 50% investment grade. Uh, so it's going to, you know, up to 50% can dip down to, to higher securitized fixed income. So it's targeting a higher yield uh, based on just where they're seeing the best relative value there. So does that portfolio have any mandated kind of weighting requirements around the type or amount of paper it holds, or is it kind of go anywhere? I know you've mentioned, you know, 50% of it has to be investment grade, but as far as the different types of paper, is there any guardrails on that or is it kind of go anywhere? Could you get, I guess my question is, can you get concentrated in one section um, over another? In terms of those four buckets, that they do have strategic kind of guardrails uh, that they try to adhere to. Um, so coming out, they, they've run the strategy for TSEC and SMA format for over a decade. It really started after the financial crisis. Uh, and at that time, it was mostly residential mortgage-backed securities. That's where they saw the most uh, relative value. Uh, that's evolved over the past 10 years or so to where it's become much more evenly dispersed between those buckets. I think going forward, you'll, you'll see it continue to be um, within their strategic guardlines that you have 10 to 40% uh, kind of give or take in any of those buckets. Um, but it hasn't been as concentrated in one bucket in a number of years now. Got it. So do you have any insight um, on kind of how the portfolio trading decisions are made and how they're moving around those buckets? Is it more of a fundamental or quantitative approach? Uh, you know, how, how are they making decision or portfolio weighting decisions in, in real time? Yeah. So it, it's based on the relative value that they're seeing across each one of those buckets and really the bottom up analysis on a particular issue. Uh, the team at Fort Washington over the last 20 something years, they, they've really developed very robust risk monitoring uh, techniques, surveillance techniques. One of the key things about uh, securitized income is it, it is really critical just to understand the, you know, the underlying assets and what that collateral looks like. Uh, being able to stress test it, uh, see if it's a recessionary scenario, what do we think uh, the cash flow profile will look like. Uh, and so they're running daily reports to look at delinquency rates, what those cash flows look like, and, and then making relative value decisions based on kind of what they're seeing from the bottom up analysis. So same same question uh, here as we had with Heat, like where where would advisor where would an advisor put this, you know, in their overall model portfolio uh, construction? Yeah, so I'll I'll talk about two C and T six. So two C and the ultra short. I think we're seeing a lot of interest there. Uh, from investors that just want to earn a little bit more on their cash uh, sleeve in the portfolio. Um, so the team at Fort Washington describes it as kind of your inside out investors or your outside in investors. 
uh, your inside out investors would be the ones that have a cash um, cash segment of their strategy. Maybe you want to segment it to carve off a slice of that cash. Say, I'm willing to take a little more price volatility risk. Uh, you want to maintain a really high quality, low duration profile uh, and just juice up the yield a little bit, earn a little bit more carry uh, on that cash that I might not need for the next 6, 12, 18 months. Um, TSEC, on the other hand, is a little bit different. I think probably the largest uh, use case we've seen for it so far is getting a, uh, you know, a complement to the high yield portion of an investor's portfolio. Historically, the strategies offered uh, you know, similar yields to high yield corporate bonds, but a much lower volatility profile. Uh, it's in the short term bond category, so you're not taking a lot of interest rate risk there. Um, for, it's a pretty, pretty compelling uh, risk return profile to pair with something like your high yield corporate bond portfolio. Yeah, no, that makes that makes a ton of sense to me. Um, kind of before before I let you go, you had mentioned earlier that you've got a, a distribution team of about fifty. You, know, you guys have been around for a long time, a very robust mutual fund business. How are you viewing? A couple of questions here, really. Is there a difference um, between how you distribute traditionally a mutual fund and how you're going about distributing, you know, these ETFs? And and are there? I'm sure there are some similarities, but what differences, you know, have you and the team kind of picked up, um, you know, over the course of trying to get these to market? Yeah, so I think I think in general our advisor population is pretty similar between mutual funds and ETFs. You know, the same advisors that historically we've sold mutual funds to. Uh, in reality, most of them are using mutual funds and they're using ETFs and maybe they're using SMAs and they're they're using all those types of vehicles together. Um, so it's a similar population of advisors. Uh, we have uh, had to make some strides as far as you know, our sales team and the the ETF vehicle specific. Um, parts of the conversation. We we brought on an ETF specialist who has a couple decades of ETF sales experience, help train our team. Just so when they're talking to advisors, telling them about the benefits of using limit orders and about all the different ETF characteristics that our sales team hasn't had to deal with those characteristics. So we've been bringing them up the curve really for probably a year before we even entered the game to make sure that they're able to um, really add value uh, to their advisors through that that sort of knowledge that couple of years ago, they probably didn't have internally. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense to me. And um, it would seem to me, maybe I'm making an assumption here, but just thinking as we're talking that the mutual, buying a mutual fund seems a lot stickier than buying an ETF, right? In a lot of instances, just because of the liquidity and, and sometimes how active managers can use them or incorporate them in a portfolio. You know, is there anything that you've learned um, about that over the period of time, just that you guys have been in the ETF business is, is it a different, you know, discussion or again, is it just the same advisors and just a different vehicle for them to be able to use? So I think what we've seen so far is there might be some higher level of turnover from advisors going into and out of the strategy because it is very liquid and tradable. Um, but I do think we're going to see a different experience for our types of strategies than maybe your your passive giant ETFs that are used in a very tactical nature have been used. Um, a lot of ETF strategists are you know, making the calls going into and out on a very short-term basis uh, for those ETFs historically. I do think a lot of our users will use it a little more strategically where they're able to get in and out when they need, but something like a 2C or a TSEC or a HEAT to be able to maintain that exposure for a year or multiple years because they do like the benefits and that the active management that strategy is able to provide. Yeah. Well, Matt, again, thank you so much for your time. Um, before I let you go, where can people learn more about you? Where can people learn more about the you know touchstone and the variety of different funds that you guys have to offer? Yeah, so the first place is, is touchstoneinvestments.com, our website. Uh, we've also got a LinkedIn page where we're uh, posting a lot of good content. So uh, please feel free to give us a follow there. Well, Matt, again, thank you for your time. I really enjoyed this. And I hope uh, in the future, you and I have a chance to meet face-to-face -face and talk in person. All right, thanks, Brad.